All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll ask you to try to uh, take your seats. Again, apologies for the compressed time period. So we have, the plans are this afternoon to have a, uh, a panel discussion. Uh, i got a bit of a mixed uh, approach to this. Um, we're, we're, uh, I've asked each of our panelists to take about five minutes or, or less and just to give their views on the research needs for uh, antibiotic stewardship in poultry production. So that could be, uh, it's entirely from, from their, their perspective. Uh, I'm not sure whether we'll have time for questions in this first part of the, the program. So what the, the intent is to then turn it back to you for about a half an hour after our panel. Uh, panelists give their presentation and ask each table to deliberate amongst yourselves about what you think are, are the key uh, issues uh, that face us in terms of providing that research base to, to improve antibiotic stewardship in the poultry industry. And that could be uh, uh, problems that need to be solved, it could be research questions that need to be answered, it could be hypotheses. It's up, up to you folks. I ask you to try to identify at least three, three uh, key uh, research uh, issues for the uh, antibiotic stewardship in poultry. And then for about half an hour, and then we'll reconvene in uh, about an hour and a half or so. And uh, we don't have time for all the tables to come and actually present the results of their discussion. So we're gonna have a bit of an uh, open uh, forum. I'll ask uh, for volunteers that on behalf of your table, to present what you think is are one or two, you know, really important research objectives, or you might have a question for our panelists. This is the time I think when it's when we best open the discussion with with the panelists and have some dialogue. Again, because this is a research day, emphasis is on research. Please, there's lots of other issues we can discuss, and you know, bring those in as, if you want. Let's try to keep the eye on the research ball. So you have a, a one pager in front of you that has. The, uh, the, a brief bio of each panelist, so I'm not going to read all that. You can look at it yourself. I'm just going to ask each panelist to, uh, to take, take the, uh, the microphone and, and give us their five minutes. And, uh, and then we also have on the flip side a bit of space for you to write out your ideas at the uh, tabletop session. So with that, I'm going to ask, uh, just go down the list in the order that they're presented here on the page. Uh, Dr. Hargis, are you prepared to uh, Give us a, a, a statement, maybe elaborate a bit on your, your uh, talk this morning about what you see as our important research needs for antibiotic stewardship of poultry. Square. Well, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I, I think that it's a huge issue. It's an issue from multiple perspectives, not just the economics of producing poultry cost effectively and that's where many folks in this room come from. But you know antibody growth promoters, what, what they really were for is improving feed efficiency, right? In a hungry world, three to six points of feed efficiency, that is a heck of a lot of grain. Um, and, and it's it's horrible loses. And then the animal welfare issues that result um, more animals getting sick animals that need to be treated with drugs that are clearly of, of clinical, human clinical significance. Um, it, it's, been a, it, it's been a tough road to hoe, I think, for a lot of people in the United States that are trying to produce grades without antibiotic label curries. Another issue that's coming up um, in the United States is what do you do if you're using a grades without antibiotics label? <coughs> but, uh, you have a, a flock that has to be treated. Perhaps just for animal welfare reasons. It's just absolutely morally essential that they be treated. Where do you divert that product? And then suddenly, if 50% of the product is being labeled race without antibiotics, what does that mean? The other 50% is the, the sick birds. Um, for some, we've got a price differential that's, that's created even again, with more and more pressure. Uh, not, not even to use drugs when they're absolutely critical to um, there, there are huge problems. I think one of the most exciting things right now is um, the potential that the antibiotic growth promoters may work through anti-inflammatory mechanisms in the host. If, if that turns out to be true, it, it 
opens the potential for mimicking those mechanisms where perhaps some of the antibody growth promoters aren't so much manipulating the microbiome as they are manipulating the host inflammatory response. And that turns out to be true, and I think we've got a chance to be able to find other alternatives that would mimic those pathways and uh, maybe come back to uh, something along the lines of antibody growth promoters. Okay, thanks very much, Dr. Hart. I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Boulan. We heard from you this morning. Do you have anything uh, to add in terms of research needs? Uh, my name is Patricia. So, in terms of research needs, as I mentioned, um, the most important pathogens right now are currently on the market for us for And we need to um, address them both at the fundamental and at the device research level. Um, there's also a Gray box, which is called supplemental price, which we need to uh, further uh, study because that's unfortunately something that we can be observing when increasing the use of antibiotics in the crops. Um, in terms of those diseases, we need to better understand their pathogenesis and transmission. Um, and this is of the utmost importance if we want to develop. <coughs> Uh, efficacious control measures and tools. Uh, there are new tools that we're raising with uh, original sequencing and then the measurement uh, analysis and all of the OMS analysis that are out there. Uh, these are very uh, powerful and uh, with we provide it's there's already are all in the pipelines analysis that are possible so that are done currently so uh, it's probably different volume out there. So it will be interesting to see how this will work because as I mentioned, we need to better understand those pathogens and to control them. Um, when it comes to microbiota analysis, metagenomic analysis, um, it might be a, what I call the temporary blocks. Um, until we can make sense of all of the articles coming out in the analysis, I think we need to process a large number, especially uh, from samples coming from the, the field. Uh, and then on a final note, we definitely need to work on technological transfer and provide the producers with tools that will help them to improve their management. Uh, we might need to go back to basics uh, and uh, go back to the ABCs of those good management practices. But there are numerous technological tools that are coming out in the market. Okay, thanks very much. Can you pass the microphone to Dr. Weaver? Uh, please, Lloyd. Thank you. Uh, I think we need to change the mindset of the poultry industry. Um, so often I'm faced with this neurotic endoritis. When they refer to the neurotic. <laughs> <laughs> You're neurotic about it. Um, as a poultry veterinarian, I, I, I really feel that we need to scientifically evaluate the alternatives to antibiotics. Um, we need to do that on a very broad scale and put some science to guesswork. Um, I also believe that um, when it comes to early chip mortality, uh, we tend to overreact. We, we forget about a major a way to, to use less antibiotics. One major way is to cull birds far more diligently. We're not doing that because we remove them from the barn so that they're less likely to infect other birds. What I'm talking about there is really, it's really a question of educating the producers and educating the veterinarians. Um, as veterinarians, I think we need to be monitored how much uh, prescribing we're doing, how much drugs we're selling, and farmers need to be monitored also. And I think the farmers can be the watchdogs of the veterinarians, and the veterinarians can be the watchdogs of the farmers. And so I think uh, when you get a collective buying in to reduce the use of antibiotics, uh, we'll be much better off. Um, as a as a as a industry. Feed companies go around and they like, I don't know if it's called bragging rights or what it is, but they like to uh, emphasize feed conversion. 
Uh, perhaps we are overemphasizing that if we grow our birds just a little bit slower, we're less likely to be challenged by necrotic enteritis. Uh, data collection is really, really important. Um, what I would really like to see is a good research project where you are uh, analyzing the data, and Dr. William just referred to this. Look at management factors that will have a very important part in uh, reducing the need for antibiotics. Um, those have to be investigated. Um, there's an old equation, I call it farmer arithmetic, and that equation goes like this. Drug usage is equal to one over accurate diagnosis, that's us, the veterinarians, plus one over management, and that's the farmer. And so the more farmers pay attention to management by monitoring their farm, and I think the boards, we're very lucky in Canada, they have boards that keep us in order, that uh, make us follow the rules of a passive, and uh, the boards have a tremendous area to play there, a part to play. Uh, for instance, Chicken Farmers of Ontario used to have just your data collection on mortality. That's wrong. You need mortality plus culling. That's, that's right. And so I'm thinking that um, there's got to be a lot of buy-in. Um, farmers, uh, we dropped, years ago, we dropped the uh, uh, plans to educate farmers, livestock medicines course. Uh, perhaps uh, it should be a question that every farmer needs to take a course to be certified, and then when you study, uh, you feel some responsibility. Okay, thanks very much, Dr. Weaver. So the next uh, uh, panelist is uh, Leanne Cooley. Leanne, if you get a microphone, please. Uh, good afternoon. You might be wondering why there's uh, an egg farmer representative sitting up here on this panel, because we're typically not uh, an area of focus for researchers or even a large part of the conversation around um, antimicrobial stewardship. Um, however, I think that we're, we're an increasing risk group for need for um, antimicrobial stewardship. The modern layman has become, um, I can only parallel her to an elite athlete. Um, her level of productivity and maintenance over a very prolonged actual production cycle uh, puts her at high need for management and um, positive strategies for, for gut health. So we're seeing some, uh, with that selection for productivity, there seems to have been a bit of a trade-off uh, similar to what we observed in the meat bird industry around immunocompetence. So we are seeing some emerging challenges with our laying hens um, as it relates particularly to um, necrotic enteritis, subclinical enteritis, and um, what I'm neurotic about boy is E. coli. So I spent a lot of time looking at E. coli. The challenge on the laying hen side though is the concept of a transmissible um, therapeutics. So on the meat bird sector, if a flock requires treatment, it may mean delayed uh, time to marketing to allow an appropriate withdrawal time for a product. However, on the egg side, we already have very limited tools in our toolbox that don't require then um, sheer dumping of the, the production and that, uh, that economic uh, element of our industry. So for me, and what I think is the most emerging on the laying hen side, um, particularly with the change to hen housing systems that is happening is really key around um, uh, enteritis but E. coli and particularly E. coli is a secondary infection but primary cause of mortality and we're typically seeing this um, in situations of pro-inflammation so when there are other inflammatory situations happening such as infectious bronchitis challenges in the field we're seeing a lot of um, associated E. coli related mortality, E. coli related loss of productivity, and some secondary, uh, again, uh, enteritis situations emerging. What I think is particularly relevant for the laying hen sector is going to be around vaccinations. That's already a tool in our toolbox. However, it's a tool in our toolbox that I think is becoming threatened under definitions related to genetically modified. There are some truly excellent vaccination products available. Um, however, these are defined technically as gene edited. And there's a lot of debate happening in the global scientific community in defining gene edited as it relates to genetically modified. 
And so I think that's an area where we need to see some very strong research involved and some strong support from our scientific community to preserve gene edited technology and vaccines, particularly for the laying and industry. I agree with Lloyd's comments around you know, producer and farmer education and coming back to some basics. And I think there's a lot of talk about the focus of the day old chick and what that seven to 10 day mortality number is, that seven to 10 day body weight gain. But we're not paying enough attention to that in our lay hen pullets. So we're tending to look at the lay hen side of things as a problem, maybe from 19 weeks onward in lay, but all of those key uh, developmental aspects for the gut, uh, for a lot of immunity is happening in that young pullet. And our young pullets are subjected to fairly extensive vaccination programs. So what's happening in these intersections of um, immune challenge through vaccination, at the same time we're trying to develop uh, coccidiosis cycling and um, uh, an intestinal um, gut microbiome that's going to take that hen successfully throughout an extended period of lay with um, minimal use for any type of um, pharmaceutical intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Our uh, next panelist to speak is uh, Jean Skodnicki from the Canadian Animal Health Institute. Coming from the um, animal health industry or the pharmaceutical industry, I think it's uh, important to recognize, and people have recognized this this morning, but that antimicrobials have made an, in an important contribution to poultry health and have helped to make food affordable and, and available to consumers and um, giving them that high quality protein to feed the, the, the population. But use of antimicrobials is not without a risk. And, and certainly the risk of antimicrobial resistance has been become very, very topical or we wouldn't be here today. Some of the things that are being done in, in Canada <coughs> really are leading to more responsible use of antimicrobials. We've talked about the removal of the growth promotion claims. That's happening as we speak. The companies that I work for are changing labels to remove the uh, those growth promotion claims. And, and in actual fact, most of the antimicrobials that are being used were being used for growth promotion reasons, but were being used for health reasons, treatment reasons. And, and in that sense, they were being used extra label. We are also going to be seeing, and I think this is where we're going to see some dramatic changes, some policy changes, which will ch move a number of the products that we have, the category two and three, and we saw those lists of, of um, uh, the active pharmaceutical ingredients um, in the presentations this morning. We'll be moving them from OTC status to prescription status. So that will mean that they'll have that oversight of the veterinarians and it lead to that greater responsible use. But again, as Lloyd said, it is going to be needing um, to be supported by um, communications on what responsible use means, both at the producer level and at the veterinary level. Um, with these changes, um, I guess the other area, and this is particularly important in the poultry sector, but I think a, a real important area where we're going to have gains in, in responsible use is the regulatory change that is now going to put in greater controls over the importation and use of non-licensed product. And that was an area where Canada had a real weakness. But with these changes as we go ahead and, and the pressure to raise <coughs> protein from poultry um, without the use of antimicrobials, we are going to have some production issues where, as are, have been identified, as well as animal welfare issues. And it's a real concern to me when I hear this talk about raised without antibiotics. What happens when our consumer Here's that the unintended consequences. Flocks where there are, you know, 21 percent dead, as high as 35 percent death, death loss. You know, how do we go back to the consumer and, and talk about that? Do we lose that trust, that social <coughs> license that, that was talked about earlier? And those are some of the things we really need to think about. There's been lots of 
we talk about alternatives to antimicrobials, and I, I wish our, our MP was still here. But one of the key issues around alternatives to antimicrobials, <coughs> uh, antimicrobials and, and actually furthering the research that's being done at this institution and others, is having regulatory pathways that enable commercialization of product. And certainly, Steve and I can both uh, talk. I, I chair the Animal Health Regulatory Advisory Committee for CIA <coughs> and Health Canada. And for the last six to eight years, we have been trying to pressure the, the government to look at some alternatives to antimicrobials and, and finding a way to commercialize those products. And it's been a tough slog. Um, you know, with one group, the feed group saying they're a drug, the drug group saying they're a feed, and it, and lo and behold, the, the products, you know, leave Canada. We can have research being done here, but it doesn't mean we're the first to adopt that research. And I think one of our other mantras should be that we should be, if we're doing the research in Canada, we should be one of the first countries in the world to adopt our own innovation. So with that, um, I, I think it's important that we have those regulatory pathways that can aid in bringing those alternatives to the marketplace. Um, certainly when we look at the alternatives to date, um, I, uh, what I've seen is they don't have the efficacy of the antimicrobials, so we'll still have to deal with a number of those uh, um, other issues around production and feed efficiency. And I think we'll end there. Um, uh, certainly, um, just a, I guess I won't end there. But one more statement. Uh, I think in a successful framework that we need to be working on for antimicrobial resistance is to look at uh, some, the impacts of our use on, on, on human health and um, that we really need to focus you know, directly on, the, on how we impact human health and, and help prioritize the work we do. Great, thanks Gene. Uh, Phil Boyd, uh, Turkey Farmers of Canada. Uh, thanks very much, it's a uh, pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting Turkey Farmers of Canada to participate. On the panel, I'll apologize. When I was in school, if you could have got the science, you studied agriculture economics, and I was a good average on the economic side. So I'm not, I'm not coming at this from a scientific perspective at all. In fact, when we were thinking about uh, what we wanted to talk about today, that, that old tune, The Steelers' Will, 1972, hit came to mind. And, and the most memorable lyric from that is, uh, the Joker's on the left, Wool's on the left of me, Joker's on the right. <laughs> and here I am, stuck in the middle with you. And, and this is a little bit about where the poultry sector sits right now, and certainly in the production sector and the turkey side. We're kind of stuck in the middle in three or four different ways. There's a, a common understanding about antimicrobial resistance, and then there's the scientific understanding of antimicrobial resistance. And the street level understanding and the science level understanding tend to clash. They're, they're kind of talking around each other and over each other. Um, at the, in, in the broad sector, we're kind of stuck between the input side, the vets, the feed mills, pharma, you know, having a specific view of the world, and, and, and Lloyd and uh, Gene both touched on that. And then on the downstream side, we've got buyers of, of live animals, processing uh, firms and packers. They're getting pressure from food service, uh, food service and retail chains reportedly driven by consumer understanding. And so we have this kind of uh, stuck in the middle uh, kind of thing. Thirdly, we've got farmers on different places on this spectrum as well. Some are ready to giddy up and go, and there's some trying RWA, which is a whole different kind of worms than what, uh, what we're talking about today, but kind of similar in its origin or in its stimulus. And so it's, and we've got others that are saying, you know, I'm feeding as directed, we're medicating as directed, uh, welfare and economics and the whole nine yards to consider. And so we have a little bit of, of that. And fourthly, we're kind of stuck in the middle a little bit with a public policy perspective as well. The Public Health Agency of Canada, CFIA, World Health Organization, FAO, and any of the policy makers that uh, Lloyd represented capably today. And how do we deal with all of those kinds of conflicting messages? 
At Turkey Farmers of Canada, we have three or four things underway in terms of an antibiotic use uh, strategy from a, a sector, sector-wide uh, working group, and I mean stand to stern uh, representation across that working group. It's just nicely out of the gate. We have an on-farm program committee that's, that's looking at this material and looking at this subject matter. And I think the Lord Lloyd's point, how do we fit in what needs to be done into our audited uh, on-farm programs, whether whether animal animal welfare or food safety is their origin. Uh, we've got some survey material that we've that we've looked at and we need to update and redo. Uh, we're under, underway with a great literature review of the, of the antibiotic research in the turkey sector, and it's taken only 10 minutes. This is one of our big challenges in the turkey business is there is a scarcity of research when it comes to this whole subject matter. If I can boil it down to four things, I, I think, you know, we need to understand from this science what the precise risk is of carrying on the way we are and what challenges that presents and make sure that we have a really good, clear understanding of that and, and can coalesce around that. Uh, from the tech transfer piece, they're, they're looking at what are the birds' responses to this change and how does that manifest itself in, in uh, poultry houses across the country. And it is going to be different in Nova Scotia than in southwestern Ontario than in the Fraser Valley. So we have all of that kind of in the mix as well. Now one of the, one of the real, I think, bugbears in all of this is how do we provide clarity to downstream uh, who, are, who are representing consumers' wishes and how do, we, how do we integrate what we're doing, the good story, the reduction, the responsible use of community genes phrase, and how do we make that make sense in light of the offerings in the meat counter? So challenges in our sector, scarcity of turkey-specific research is, is really significant, probably issue number one. Uh, secondly, there's lots of work that's been done on chicken boilers, and what could we learn from that that's applicable into the rearing of turkeys and the management of turkeys? And speaking of management, then how do we work with our farmers to be able to address the management needs when we get to reduce juice? And all of the elements that have to, is it water sanitation or is it birds, is it density in barns? There's numbers of things that we need to look at. Uh, I think the other piece that, that we've, we've come up with is alternative products and what alternative products are there in order to address some of the conditions that can persist. Uh, but in some ways, as a, as, a, as a poultry sector, as a turkey sector, as a science, as a science group, one of the challenges is really to help our consumers understand the wheat from the chaff and to move forward on some basic uh, common, common, common point there. So, uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Phil. Great. Thanks, Phil. Uh, Steve Leach, Chicken Farmers of Canada. Uh, thanks a lot and appreciate being here this afternoon on the panel. I think that, uh, you know, on the sheet in front of you, you have uh, assumptions for the discussion of what's going to happen over the next five years. I think, uh, I think those are great assumptions to make. One, because it's going to push us, hopefully, this afternoon and realize that uh, there is an opportunity and, and certainly knowing where the industry is headed, how do we go come about that from a research perspective. I think, two, uh, the other reason that, that those are good assumptions, as Phil has indicated, uh, there's extreme pressure right now from the retail and, and restaurant uh, side uh, in order to, to move forward to, to reduce the use of antibiotics and in the poultry industry, specifically looking at the preventative use of antibiotics of importance to humans. I think that is really where the focus is going to be. And I bring that up because I think from a research perspective, uh, that's a huge opportunity. You know, this is, this is a time where we know there are large changes coming to the industry, whether it's five years or another time frame that's going to happen. It's it's going to impact, uh, you know, 80 to, to 100 percent of, uh, of the producers across the country, and we know that there are going to be impacts from an animal wealth, uh, animal health, and uh, and welfare perspective. Uh, so I think uh, I, I'm not sure in, in what other time you know we've been able to foreshadow such change within an industry, but the key here is that we're looking for answers from uh, from research um, and innovation to be able to take our our industry forward. So I think from a research perspective, that, that's very clear and. Uh, and uh, beneficial as we look forward. Really, the, the three strategies that we focused in on as an organization are, are vaccination, uh, pathogen control and reduction, uh, security, et cetera, and the third one being dietary uh, modifications, additions, et cetera. And I think that when I look at it, all three of those areas are critical because I don't think that there is a silver bullet in there that's going to be a replacement for the preventative use and the antibiotics that are currently being used. So I think we need a little bit of work in, in all of those areas. 
from a vaccine perspective, we've you know we've heard a lot this morning about uh, necrotic enteritis, and, and maybe uh, I need to be taking some advice from the panel as well. But uh, certainly, I think if you look across the world, I mean that's a I I, I call it kind of like a holy grail of, of uh, vaccine uh, development for the for the poultry industry. And aside from that, you know anything that is reducing uh, or has an impact on immune suppression that is not allowing the, the growth and, and the health of those chickens. I think those are two key areas. Uh, from, a, from a pathogen reduction perspective, I think there's still work to be done, for example, on, on cleaning disinfection protocols, these types of things. But a lot of, a lot of work has been done there, and I think that one area that uh, you know, research can still play a role in, but we need to do a better job of communicating what's actually been done and, and uh, some of the trials and errors that have happened. Uh, so that we can move forward as an industry in a, in a better fashion. So that's a that's an important one on pathogen reduction. On the dietary side of things, obviously looking at uh, acidifiers, probiotics, etc., and effective products. I think that's really key in terms of moving forward. That we hear a lot about these products that work in some situations, not in others. How can we refine that and, and make these uh, better for the industry? These are going to be huge tools moving forward, and uh, we need to learn from some of the. Uh, some of the things that have happened in the past, but also moving forward and, and looking for, for better products. And, and the last one that I just threw out there in, in terms of in ovo stimulation and, and a lot of work being done in this area, whether it's uh, vaccines or, or challenges or, or feeding, I think that uh, you know the more that we can do to ensure the quality and health of that day-old chick coming to the farm, the better off we are. The better start we give that chick, uh, the more opportunity for um, to prevent some of the some of the issues, uh, growth related mortality, et cetera, that we're seeing. Certainly, this is a huge area of development, and I think uh, has an opportunity to to develop even further because there has been some some gains in that area. So I'll leave that now. Okay, thanks very much, Steve. Uh, Rebecca Irwin from the uh, Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, so, and historically, I'll be sort of helps because it gives you sort of a bit of the big picture. So it was 97 when a consensus conference came together with epidemiologists and veterinarians and, and, and infectious disease people and nutritionists and the DNA Institute. Everybody else got together and said, ooh, AMR is a problem in human meds and what we can do about it. They came up with, I think it was 27 recommendations um, and mainly focused on the human side. Reducing use, targets, uh, infection control, all those kinds of things coming at it, both the community level and the hospital level. But there was one question when they said, oh, what about the agri-food side? What about reducing it? Shouldn't we sort of try and monitor what's going on? And that was sort of when CPARs were born. Um, and that question back then was, what is the proportion of human AMR that can be attributed to antimicrobial use in animals. And last Friday I had a CBC reporter ask me the same question. And we're closer in some areas in being able to say, okay, you know, we know sort of more about transmission routes. We know a little bit more about where antimicrobials are being used. We know a little bit more about the mobility of genes and everything else. But we still are kind of going, I don't know, what do you think? 10%, maybe 20? <laughs> um, and it's still, it's still a bit of a sticky situation. So there's still those kinds of questions when you're looking at the transmission of antimicrobial resistance along the food chain from animals to humans in, in direct contact. What is the actual uh, risk of um, transmission? And so those kinds of questions are always sort of in the background when you're developing your surveillance system. And so over the years, we, we tried to make sure we were collecting from the right spots. So right now, CPARS is at the farm, it's, it's at abattoirs, it's at retail food, and we have uh, some human pathogens, and so salmon a little bit more in Antibacter. And when we started looking at retail food, we started in Quebec and Ontario, and lo and behold, that's what we detected, that there was a higher proportion of salmonella vitaburga chicken 
and humans that were carrying this septic fear resistance. And it was different than Ontario. And so that's when the, the sort of the investigation started. And we were able to start tracking what was going on. And then there was the poultry industry who took a very strong proactive response to reduce use. And then we were able to track the, the drop in resistance in both the chicken isolates and the human isolates. So as Scott had mentioned in his presentation, that was pretty profound in being able to have that actual linkage. But we still didn't really have the use piece other than information that was gathered through the University of Montreal, Martin's work. Um, looking at the, at hatcheries at that time, but you know, so the, the gaps remain in terms of where is the use and what is going on. So right now we have we have the poultry industry participating in our broiler sentinel surveillance system at the farm level, and um, through that we we've been able to capture some elements of use and and, uh, and be able to start to really look at. Um, potential uh, methodologies to have the right metric to be able to compare between farms and compare between uh, regions, et cetera. But it's not that comprehensive, and, it, and, it's, and it's missing pieces. And the pieces that are missing is the drivers for antimicrobial uh, use, um, the different veterinary practices, what, what are they using, um, the, uh, the actual animal health components, we, we have that sort of gap in terms of animal pathogens, um, and where where antimicrobial resistance is rising in animal pathogens that may be driving antimicrobial use. Um, so there's there's those kinds of gaps. And then, so yes, we have the poultry industry, we've got the broiler sector, but we don't have the breeder sectors. We don't know what use is going on in, in, the, in the parents or the grandparents. Um, and then and certainly on the turkey side, we recognize that you know, there's some work we'll be able to do through research programs, but it's not, it's not sort of a, a fundamental piece of, of what we can do in terms of ongoing um, surveillance. So there's, there's those, those kinds of gaps. And then you know, really having a better appreciation of what's going on in the feed industry, which is sort of a feed component. We have little bits and pieces, but we don't have uh, strong data that's actually uh, focused in those areas. So what has happened is the poultry industry took a reactionary response to the surveillance data and immediately put in the ban and we've been able to monitor the reduction. But what we can't monitor is sort of all those economic impacts, the, the actual cost to animal health, the, the cost to, to the producer, the, you know, all those kinds of secondary questions that come out from these kinds of responses. So when I'm thinking about you know, research areas, I'm thinking about economic, strong economic analyses that can really start to answer the, the cost of antimicrobials, the cost of not using them, the, the conflict of interest pieces with veterinarians, all the different things in terms of distribution channels that may have an impact. All of these kinds of pieces need to come together to really help um, put a picture in place that allows a sustainable system to go forward. So um, I think that's kind of where I wanted to go with it. Uh, I think there's there's various pieces that we're, we're continuing to identify in, in CPARS. Um, one of them is that regionally we're seeing uh, fluoroquinone resistance in, in Campylobacter, um, and that's different in different provinces, so there's obviously drivers going on there. Um, and so again, it's needing to tease out what are the drivers for trying to deal with an uh, issue like Salmonella and Caribbean. Um, in terms of reduction strategies um, versus, you know, basically using a, an antimicrobial that may have a temporary reduction. So, so there's those kinds of questions. We're seeing high levels of multi-drug resistant uh, organisms in, in clinical isolates from cattle and, and different uh, sectors of that, that uh, industry also need that focus. So I think I'm going to leave it there. Just, to, just in closing, basically say that surveillance can only go so far. But it's the identification of pieces of what's happening in surveillance that needs to feed into the research side um, so that we can have a more fulsome understanding of, of this very complex issue. And so I look forward to continuing to work with you on this. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And to round out the uh, uh, panel statements, we'll have uh, Dr. John Prescott from the University of Guelph. Thank, thanks, Scott, and thank you for asking me to be here. I'm going to go by my talk into or comments into two parts. Firstly, in terms of research, um, 
people have talked a lot about necrotic enteritis and clearly this, this is a huge issue for broilers if we can't continue to use antibiotics to, uh, to control necrotic enteritis in the, 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 the prophylactic way. Um, there have been huge advances in understanding of clostridium perfringens and necrotic enteritis in the, in the last decade. It's really quite unbelievable what, what has been discovered, a lot of it by people people in this room. We're now, we're now in the golden age of microbiology, and so the, the ability to, to understand the pathogen, understand the processes, is tremendous. We're not in the golden age of funding, but, but certainly the science is, is quite staggering. Um, perfringens, Prostridium perfringens is kind of a scary bacterium, but one of the things we've learned in the chronic enteritis is highly specialized. It has, has evolved to cause the chronic enteritis, and that's a huge weak point for it. So it has a lot of uh, weak points, and to me, uh, the chronic enteritis provides a, a superb system for the development of the next generation of agricultural specific antimicrobials based on what we understand it. And I, I know you're not allowed to use the word antimicrobial anymore, but you could call it antivirulent factor or, or something like that, but it's uh, essentially uh, the same thing. And as Martine said, look, we're just starting to understand the pathogenesis of this organism, how it actually causes disease, but I think we're realizing that its ability to colonize mucus, to colonize mucosal surfaces, is probably every bit as important, maybe more important, than its ability to, to cause, uh, uh, produce toxins. So I think it's got numerous uh, weak points and it has great potential just to target these specific, uh, specific uh, organisms. Um, my second sort of comments uh, about antimicrobial stewardship, I, I think, uh, as Steve Leach said, and uh, Scott produced them, I think the assumptions about where we'll be in the next five year, years are actually right on. I think those are the assumptions we have to work, work around. There, there are many different types of, of antibiotic-free chickens. There's RWA, organic, humane, raised, lots of false and quite misleading label claims, and I think a huge amount of confusion out there about antimicrobials and you know, what different types of antimicrobials, and maybe it's driven by consumers, maybe it's driven by other, other processes. Um, I think a lot of the birds are, are what I call RWW, potentially, which is raised without welfare, and uh, I, I share um, Jean's concerns about welfare issues. I don't think we want to go to RWW birds. Um, antibiotics are great, they produce absolutely incalculable benefits to uh, humanity, but not all antibiotics are, are equal. Um, for example, if you want to control necrotic enteritis, it's been, it can be controlled by using Bacillus subtilis as a probiotic, spores of Bacillus subtilis. It controls necrotic enteritis very well, but Bacillus subtilis produces bacitracin. So I, I'm not sure that we want to replace uh, bacitracin with a, with a probiotic that actually produces bacitracin. To me, that doesn't make sense. Um, there's lots of toxic antibiotics there. There are a lot of antibiotics discovered in the early days of antibiotic discovery in the 50s, which can't be used in humans because they're so toxic. And um, I think at the moment, uh, uh, Martine mentioned avilomycin. Uh, she said it's category four. Well. Uh, category 4, kind of not important in human medicine, it actually hasn't been categorized because I think Health Canada is not prepared to categorize it because they don't have the, the courage to do so. But I, but I, think, I think they should do. And if, if there turns out to be a problem with resistance, which there could be, then let's deal with the problem, but not just sort of not categorize it. And I think, I suspect there's a lot of other antimicrobials out there which could be used to control necrotic enteritis without in any way impacting human health, but if it's shown to, then let's deal, deal with that. Another really effective way to control necrotic enteritis is with lysozyme. Lysozyme is, is egg white, um, and you can use, I think, 100 parts per million of lysozyme to control necrotic enteritis. It's 50 parts per million of bacitracin, so it gives you some idea. Um, the person who, and we use lysozyme in, um, in the lab to weaken the cell wall of, of, 
clostridium perfringens so if we want to do some genetic manipulation. Um, lysozyme was actually discovered by Sir Alexander Fleming in 1920 as he was looking for antimicrobials. And uh, so I, I mean, I think there actually are potentials to control necrotic enteritis with alternatives we already have. And, um, and then, I, uh, so I, th I think we could potentially be entering the golden age of antimicrobial uh, therapy targeted in, uh, in uh, agriculture. Um, I, I do think that we need to keep monitoring antimicrobial use, and as others have said, I think that will be a requirement anyway under the pan-Canadian framework for action. Um, we need to understand why veterinarians are using antibiotics, or why farmers are using antibiotics, what, what the drivers are, and you know, that can be linked into the benchmarking process. Um, and I think I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much, John. I think a round of applause for our panelists, please. <laughs> uh, some excellent comments and, and really insightful uh, views from different perspectives. Now, I think it's, uh, it's almost time to, to put you folks to work. You've uh, kind of been sitting here soaking it up and listening. Um, you know, it's uh, traditional in, in these kinds of things to actually have, try to have some some participate, uh, participant, participant engagement, and that's what we're going to do. I know it's, uh, it's kind of work, but, but there you go. So try to identify what you think are key research uh, questions, issues. Uh, uh, there may be things that weren't raised by the panelists that you think are, uh, are worthy of discussion, they're important, bring those out. Uh, I don't think we'll enter into a question and answer uh, phase right now with the panelists. So if you have questions, uh, that you want clarified, then save those because we're going to have a general discussion after, uh, let's say, uh, uh, what time is it there? Let's say 25 minutes of table discussion at about 2.30, and shortly thereafter we'll, we'll reconvene. And I'm going to ask each uh, people from the various tables to, uh, to give us your, your views. You may repeat some things that have been said, that's fine, that endorses the importance of what the panelists say, but you may have different, uh, you may have different issues, you may have other questions. Okay, so get to work, use those sheets, fill them out. We're gonna be collecting them afterwards because uh, the, uh, uh, the stewardship, uh, the group that's developing the uh, stewardship proposal would like to have your ideas. Versus that's the price of, uh, of lunch today, I guess. So, so please, uh, please write those down, and they'll be uh, well used. Thanks very much, folks. Hopefully, all the tables have come up with some uh, great ideas for research. I know the uh, panelists could probably answer questions from where they are, but I think just to remind everybody that you're here, let's, uh, let's, let's get back up up front. <laughs> yeah. So we don't have numbered tables, so I can't really go around the room, and I'm not sure I really want to point. So I'm hoping that, uh, that we have uh, people who are prepared to get up and speak and ask questions. We have two microphones uh, floating around the room. So if, if, uh, if you can pause or wait long enough until uh, we get a mic in your hand. And uh, say, so it's ideas, questions for the panelists, uh, points of departure from what's been said, things you really disagree with, uh, think that's nonsense. Any, anything like that is fine. So who'd like to start things off? Feel like an auctioneer here. Uh, Patrick. Okay. So um, we've tried to play that game with the three uh, major issues, okay? And we've come with three, I think that just two, so the three are coming from me, but uh, <laughs> uh, the first one is, I think it's been identified by other people, and I've not heard much about it here, is rapid diagnostic for, vet, for animal diseases. I think for us, uh, animal disease are all is what drives antibiotic use in animals. And frequently we use antibiotics without knowing exactly what the disease is, without knowing what the resistance is for the bug we are trying to fight. And we need rapid diagnostic first to identify the cause of the disease, if it's a microbial one, 
And then we need to know very fast what this drug is resistant to so that we use the right antibiotics. And I think that's one of the major issues which, which we should drive uh, after. And uh, there isn't much done yet on that topic. Okay. And I think that's, that's our first priority. In terms of the stakeholders, I think there is a whole number of them. Uh, in terms of that fast diagnostic, uh, I think there is somebody who is going to feed uh, our meal here in terms of the problems and the challenges with that fast, uh, quick diagnostic or rapid diagnostic. Uh, and the need for diagnostic is who is going to pay for it? And, and who is willing to pay for it? So I don't know if you want to continue the discussion we had at the table at some point. Um, and maybe I identify the, the two other issues and then we'll, we'll, we'll continue. The next one is the story of the co-selection. Uh, when you use an antibiotic, is it going to select for other resistances at the same time? Uh, I put it in the context always of the classification. I know it's not always welcome that I question it, but uh, this classification from Health Canada or from the WHO, from the OIE, in classifying very important, less important, not very important for human health or for animal health. Uh, we've seen the example of colistin lately, which was at the very bottom of the list and suddenly jumped on top of the list. So we have to keep in mind that these classifications are very nice, but they have to be dynamic, very dynamic. And we should do some surveillance in terms of understanding how they change, if they are likely to change, and when they are going to change, and how. And that's the whole issue of co-selection, I think, we should address. So who should be doing that? I think there is lots of politics, there is lots of surveillance, there is lots of research uh, involved in that. And then um, our last or third priority we had in our, at our table, was about the involvement of farmers in terms of helping to identify problems, in terms of uh, looking at the practicalities of things, also in terms of taking part in decisions and also being trained, having access to information which uh, farmers not always have to in terms of helping them understanding and taking decisions. Um, and in, in that uh, topic, we also identified welfare as a very important one we should be tackled. Uh, okay. I think I'll stop there. And if we want to talk about the willingness to pay, because the, the story with the involvement of the farmers and, and willingness to participate is also important. Okay, thanks very much, Dr. Boron. So, any of the panelists want to respond? Again? So, for the conversation we were having at the table um, and this concept of willingness to pay. So, one of the things identified in some of the discussion today is, is accurate use. Of these, um, of these products and of these antibiotics. And quite often what we see happening on farm is there's sort of a, a gross pathology that's done on mortality at the farm, and a diagnosis is often made based upon that, as opposed to um, full you know, histopathological, histopathological workups or bacterial cultures, et cetera. And part of that is because the time associated to turn some of that information around even though animal health lab is wonderful and they try to expedite things, but it can be seven, ten days sometimes before you're getting a full picture. And particularly as it relates to a bacterial culture, is, is there antibiotic sensitivity there to what the veterinarian is intending to prescribe? And so we, we often see prescriptions written um, for things based on a growth pathology on farm. Only later to have the information come back to say, okay, actually, it, you know what, it was tetracycline resistant, and you just spent two weeks putting tetracycline into a tetracycline resistant flock to treat kind of a, you know, an E. coli problem. So part of that is this whole concept of willingness to pay. And I'm not sure, to be honest, how that has evolved within the poultry sector. And that there is sometimes a bit of perception at the farm level that a problem has come to their farm, that it came um, inherent with those chicks from the hatchery, that it has resulted from uh, perhaps uh, something that the feed company did in terms of changing feed composition. And so I've, I've faced a situation where I've had farmers phone me up and say, well, I've just got a $1,400 diagnostic bill from Animal Health Labs in my veterinarian. Who am I supposed to send this to to pay the bill? And I'm like, well, no, you're to pay the bill. And he's like, well, if I had known it was going to be this much, well, I wouldn't have gone ahead with all of that diagnostic work. So we do have a little bit of a bottleneck on farm when it comes to if we're going to use proper diagnostic procedures, if we're going to try to use these um, and you know hopefully some some more quick tests to see if there is you know antibiotic sensitivity there before prescription is written, there needs to be 
um, an eye to cost effectiveness. And because some of these can be fairly substantial diagnostic bills on farm, and if there is no willingness to pay on the part of the farmer, how are we going to handle overcoming that gap at, at the farm level? Uh, else would like to comment. Excellent, excellent comment. Any other panelists want to uh, foray into that? Okay. I will from 100 years ago when I managed a diagnostic lab and we weren't encumbered by so many rules uh, as, as modern diagnostic labs are. You, you know, frequently in terms of therapeutic antibiotics, they were indicated maybe 80% of the, 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 the reasons for recommending or prescribing an antibiotic was, was either cholibacillosis, uh, pasteurellosis, or mycoplasmosis. You know, that, that encompassed the, the big bulk of it. And the, the two that you couldn't differentiate grossly, especially with turkeys, um, was cholera versus cholibacillosis. And what what we did, I was taught to do this by a whole veterinarian at Texas A&M. Um, you, it's, it's not, it's not righteous. It's, it's not, it's not correct, but it worked. You know, we would take the a primary swab from liver, which should be aseptic, and we would culture for differential diagnosis, and but we would also strip several blood auger plates, and Ron Kirby Bowers directly on the. Outer place. So the next morning, you could differentiate E. coli and pastorella, and you had a reasonable idea of what the sensitivity was, what, what a good choice would be if there was one. And now I think you'd be up against all kinds of headaches for taking that shortcut. And so we don't believe it. You know, and and um, I, I don't know, it's, it's, I, I hear the point, but overnight's not too long. You know, it's, it's, and now with uh, and mycoplasma, we have improved greatly on that. We can't get that for an IV stand. Hey, thanks, man. Come on. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Good comments about rapid diagnosis. Under the, the Pan-Canadian Framework for Action, which is going to be published in about May 2017, they have four pillars. One is surveillance, the other is stewardship, one is infection prevention and control, and the last one is innovation. And I think as part of the innovation that's anticipated globally, but also in, in Canada, in health and possibly you know, veterinary medicine, rapid diagnosis is a really important part of, of innovation. We, we need cheap, effective, immediate rapid diagnostics. Somebody talked about one today, so sort of biosensors, but I agree absolutely with that. And hopefully the pan-Canadian framework will result in an action plan, which is the next steps, and there will be monies available to try to promote innovations and the sort of things that you, you talked about. The other thing I think Scott mentioned is the use of, say, third-generation cephalosporins in Holland that you would require a culture and susceptibility test before they would be used. And I could see that coming as part of the ongoing changes and the improvement in the way that veterinarians actually use antimicrobials. And the co-selection piece, yeah, I agree. If, if a villamycin you know, co-selects for an important resistance, then we have to deal with those issues as they occur, but not pre-anticipated necessarily. Thank you very much. Any other panelists? All right, let's open up for some other questions or comments from another table. Any uh, volunteers? Yeah. Yeah. We'll get to you. Thanks, and thanks to everybody on the panel. Um, first of all, I'm an egg farmer, so I'm going to be coming at this maybe from a different angle in that uh, we've reduced uh, antimicrobials in, in our sector to a minimal. And my concern is as we move forward, um, especially as we're moving to more alternative housing and birds back on the floor, there may be a tendency that we're going to have to use more antimicrobials as we go ahead. So we think it's really important that, uh, that we benchmark where we are today uh, on, on our different housing systems. And uh, so we know where we're at from a conventional enriched and, and alternative housing system and be able to move forward and see 
what the repercussions are of, of some of these housing changes as, as we move ahead. And I, I agree with Leanne to uh, a certain extent on some of the vaccination programs and some of the things that even just because of that we're, we're seeing a bit of a change. But I think sometimes it's more, more housing related. And my fear is that based on the agenda today, I think with the exception of, of one presentation, everything has basically been related to meat production and broilers. So obviously we're not on the radar now, and I really don't want to be on the radar as far as my antimicrobials go, but I do have this fear, and I think one of the things that would be really good from a research standpoint is doing some benchmarking. So I'll offer that up to our panel. Any response or comments? That's what we have. Steve? Yeah, just to add to that, I think that, uh, you know, the, the benchmarking of certainly on the, on the youth side has been very important. We've been talking internally about uh, future policies and, and any micro reduction strategies. And it was mentioned earlier today the, the, the category of one use, uh, preventative use ban in, in, in the poultry industry. And, you know, we, we were able to have use statistics before and after. And CPARS has last August released a resistance uh, report as well. And that's been pretty helpful on two fronts. One, in terms of talking to the, the public and media to demonstrate that the industry has been proactive and has done something, but also speaking to uh, our producers and our, and our ag community, indicating that you know, all the hard work and, uh, and commitment that went into that has actually been beneficial. So just in support of your surveillance. Any other comments from the panel? Yeah. I, I totally agree with you, Scott, that benchmarking should be a priority for the industry in this area. And Egg Farmers of Canada on the Research Committee is currently has moved forward with funding a, a benchmarking project around better scoring. And, and I think, you know, a proposal coming from the province is on a, a similar, you know, scope in terms of looking at antimicrobial use uh, would be a good thing to come into the Research Committee. One challenge a little bit with the with that probably on the, the lane hand side is the fact that Right now, the antibiotics that do tend to be used um, don't require a prescription other than bacitracin. So when we look at tetracycline uses um, on farms across the province, when we look at um, amphrobium, perhaps penicillin and pullets, a lot of that can be done um, unscripted. And so then it really does come where we need that farmer buy-in. We talked about that farmer buy-in and sort of ground up participation to, to be willing to reveal that information um, to be part of it. Thanks, Leanne. Jean? Just to point out, um, though, that many of these products will become have prescription status in the near future. So there is an ability to collect that information, um, whether it be through the prescription and you know, electronic, electronically, I think, with the software and, and hardware that we have. Um, there are capabilities as long as everyone's willing. Yeah. Great. Uh, Bill? Yeah, but, uh, I wanted to mention Jean's point about it. We did a survey, uh, where I think Willie Ellis part of the grocery brand, uh, and that was about three and a half or four years ago. And on category one, we found uh, one incident. So, you know, stopping the preventative use of category one in our sector was, I don't know, brainer. It wasn't, it wasn't complicated, it wasn't uh, highly used. It changes when we get into category two and three, and so we're trying to get our heads around how do we how do we survey our growers on an ongoing basis and get meaningful but timely information on how this tracks from, you know, kind of from today moving forward? Um, I think the other thing that is important, and I, I, but, but based on what Gene says, so there's one avenue of data collection there, but I would be reluctant to not survey farmers because one of our findings was how little our farmers really knew about what was in their feed and what compounds were there and what category they belonged to. and so. This is almost an education piece to keep that survey in front of the growers and keep them filling it out. And it's, there's a there's a whole learning process there that uh, that I think is is going to be really important moving forward. Thanks. Great, thank you. That's absolutely true. There's a lot of times you hear from farmers. It's I'm not sure it's whatever my feed guy put in. Well, all the problems start with chips full of feed anyway. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Other uh, research priorities, other questions from, uh, from participants? We've only heard from two tables, so there was uh, either a lot of talk about uh, last night's hockey game or something else, <laughs> or, or else uh, you kind of agree with what's been said so far. Yeah? 
Uh, our table kind of focused a little bit on uh, looking at the environment uh, nutrition and interaction. Uh, we, we don't really understand that well enough. Um, every farm is different. We know that certain products don't work on one farm and they do work on another. Is it a function of the environment or is it a function of the uh, product being uh, less replicable or is it the interaction between the two? Understanding that will help us target solutions for uh, different problems. Another area that we talked about is just looking at uh, genetics. Obviously, we have the standard genetics that we're using across the industry, but are there breeding programs that we could put into place in order to breed for improved disease resistance? Uh, I know that uh, some of the turkey sectors are, are doing a little bit of that, but uh, we should be enhancing that a little bit more. The other one that we talked about is uh, just looking at uh, vaccination. I know we're moving a lot more on the vaccination side, on the, on the pullet rearing side, we are doing a little bit of that on the, on the broiler side, but as we develop new vaccines for whether that's Campylobacter or others, um, what are the interactions? Because we know that there's a growth depression effect of vaccination programs. What can we do to mitigate some of those? Thank you very much. Any panelists? Uh, John, do you like to comment? Yeah, uh, Greg and I were, were at a really good uh, cardiac enteritis conference in Copenhagen a couple of years ago, so there was a, a chicken breeder there, somebody from the large chicken breeding companies, who talked about selection for resistance to necrotic enteritis. I don't know if you remember that, Greg. I think he could probably breed chickens to drive a car down the road if you asked him, <laughs> asked him to. And that maybe this ties in with what Billy Hargis was talking about, about gut inflammation and so on. So, so actually there are models which could be used to select for resistance to specific and infections, which, which he seemed to think would, would be quite quick, like it was a few, few years. You know, you shake your head as well, but, but I, was, I was surprised. But uh, I think there are possibilities in genetics. Thanks, John. Any other comments? Uh, other, uh, sorry, Bill. We did a uh, trial for one of the pioneer breeders about three or four years ago. We sip tested um, some of their pedigree lines and we challenged with uh, I'm very Dr. Barry, part of that. And it was remarkable that some of the pedigree families um, were much more resistant to I'm very challenge in terms of reduction in body weight gain than others. The birds were co-mingled, they were all challenged with the same level of I'm So So there is, there is the potential for selecting for genetic resistance, but as you <coughs> add differentials to your Selection and actually make less buyers for feed efficiency, body weight, gain, and, and so forth, and leg strength, and you know all those things that are also very important. So it's a it's a value proposition, I think, for the breeders. Yeah. Um, the only other comment I would add is coming back to my initial remarks around, um, and I agree completely about uh, this movement towards vaccine and, and more vaccination um, therapies. But as it relates to that, that key phrase of gene edited versus transgenic vaccines. Um, if you look at what's available presently for E. coli vaccines, for Salmonella vaccines, they're all a gene edited vaccine. And right now, when we get, uh, I deal with a lot of consumer inquiries from my company and questions around, well, what does GMO mean? You know, and our, our standard response is that, you know, an, an egg is not genetically modified, even though the hen may eat GMO feed, because it's a function of her metabolism. But once we start changing to where we're now administering um, gene edited, um, possibly, I don't know down the road, maybe a transgenic vaccine, that might change the thinking about now is this animal functionally a GMO, um, which, which then changes how, how we're getting that body at the consumer level right now. So again, that, that scientific support behind using gene editing as a tool within vaccines without it crossing over into that full GMO or that, that transgenic type category. It is going to be really critical for the scientific communities to make but, but of course that's the that's the exact opportunity with truly transgenic organisms that, yeah. that you can have to to speak to one of the concerns about multiple vaccines and multiple hits on in terms of vaccine reactions and reduced performance. You there's very little evidence that there's uh, a meaningful cost for acquired immune response to a given set of antigen cargo. It's, it's the actual vector itself that's causing the damage that, that causes the vaccine reaction. And 
you know, in principle, um, now and clearly in theory, um, you can vector multiple antigens with the same the same uh, vector, but you're now talking about common organisms, um, which would be safer for the animal, more broadly efficacious, um, avoids the use of chemicals for for preventing those things. But oh my God, it's been genetically modified. Um, it's a to some extent, we kind of, as a society, we shoot ourselves in the head. Great comments. Any other uh, questions, research priorities, uh, points of debate? Quite a few silent tables out there. <laughs> I, have to, I can have another one. Of course, yeah. <laughs> talking about mostly today is all about necrotic enteritis as being the elephant in the room. Uh, maybe the white elephant, uh, for lack of a better term, is coccidiosis. It's probably the world number one disease and it's the biggest single precursor factor to necrotic enteritis. What are we doing beyond vaccination as we move to banning other technologies, whether that is removing the bionophores in no antibiotics ever in the US or in Canada what we call RWA where these very efficacious technologies are no longer allowed, what alternatives do we have beyond vaccination uh, to, to address those concerns? Great question. Any uh, panelists want to weigh in? The inability to distinguish between third generation self-responents and an board um, is staggering, right? Um, What's being done in the U.S. quite a bit is, um, uh, is becoming more and more popular is bio shuttles where uh, you can't use ionophores but you can vaccinate and then come in with a chemical um, to, to control the vaccine reaction. In theory, that can be done in perpetuity as long as you're displacing a wild type resistant uh, OSS with drug sensitive vaccine strains. Yeah, and so you Theoretically, you could get away with um, one chemical and a, and a vaccine cocktail over and over again. The comments? Okay, any other questions, research ideas? Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess it's a good thing I came after, Greg, right? because it may have sounded a little bit biased from this table if we talked about coccidiosis. <laughs> <laughs> but that was another one of our, our big things of our research ideas is one of the precursors, one of the big precursors really is coxie when it comes to so many different things. So maybe trying to better understand the bug in the many different ways that we can better un understand the bug can then help us to sort of understand where we're going in terms of necrotic enteritis, where we're going in terms of um, RWA production and, and so on and so forth. So. And, and I think another thing to add to that too is if you look back at several years, there were many very great coccidiologists, whereas now it's much less so. So there's more, more to, to go in that way. Um, and then another one that we also came up with too was one of the common themes from a couple different presentations was this idea of inflammation and the idea that inflammation is bad. So we want to be able to stop it um, not necessarily from the bug itself, but more so from the um, response of the bird. So perhaps in some ways where it may not necessarily solve the problem, so to speak, but be able to help with the issue is looking at more anti-inflammatories. And there's been studies that have been done, um, again, way back when, in terms of using ibuprofen or aspirin, um, both in birds and then also in, in some ways in cows and sort of the impact that this has, as well as other alternatives, where, again, we're not necessarily dealing with killing or reducing the bug, whatever bug that may be itself, but more so the reaction to the bug on behalf of the host. So what can we do this way to help at the farm level for what we're seeing and, and how, um, how the birds are reacting, reacting to these diseases? And then we also had about um, breeding programs where we know in terms of breeding programs, they get into, they have to do sort of that final section of seeing how those birds react in terms of a conventional system, because this is what we've had for so long. But what happens if we have these birds and how they react in an RWA system? 
where it's not a super clean um, grandparent stock room, but more so what we would actually see in the field of conventional versus an RWA system and where we can move that way. And maybe that can help as well. Okay, thanks very much. Any panelist uh, comments? Okay, do we have uh, any other uh, speakers? Anybody else have a research idea or a question, comment? Um, okay, at our table, we would concur with the genetic research on um, resistance to different diseases and um, also looking at um, RWA um, systems and what makes them successful and trying to emulate that and or, you know, document it. But our biggest thing was looking at stakeholders involved in challenges. We feel that there's a big challenge in having a supportive regulatory system in Canada for um, for the registration of new products, for instance. So that's a kind of a difficult hurdle in our country. So um, it's not really a research item, but um, we also more research on mechanisms of how alternatives to antibiotics and antibiotics do promote growth so that we can, you know, we can figure out how to make that work better. So. And also, um, one other thing is uh, on-farm research is a bit difficult, so when you're testing a drug or something, there's hurdles to get over to try and bring it into the field. Thank you very much. Panelist, Jean? As John mentioned earlier, um, we're going to have a new framework document be published, and with that will come an action plan and one uh, for the pillar of um, research and innovation. I think there's a lot of us that are going out there and saying, well, part of that research and innovation should be associated with having a regulatory system that is does enable commercialization of these products and bringing these products to the Canadian marketplace in a timely way. So I think that's got to be part of the action plan as we move forward. We can't take the six to eight years to discuss, you know, how long it's going to take to get a gut modifier registered as a feed additive with CFIA versus as a drug with Health Canada. Okay, other comments? Great, any, uh, any other uh, questions? Okay. Hi, this is more of a a common or philosophy idea. Um, we seem to be getting pushed around in the agricultural world right now by everyone focusing on a single issue. So we have the animal welfare pressures, and then we have the environmental pressures, and we have the antimicrobial pressures, and we have all these different single aspect demands, whether something's GMO or not. Um, and I don't know you know, if, if the Renaissance man is dead, um, but the idea of someone or some entity who can take an overview of a lot of these things, um, you know, the consumers or the welfare researchers or whoever is asking for birds to be taken out of cages, do they realize the environmental, um, you know, antimicrobial, you know, economic, all the other aspects that come with it? Because on a farm, none of these play in isolation. And I mean, the, the modern scientific method is to learn more and more about less and less. You know, until you become a, an, an absolute, you know, world expert on a cytic program. But we need someone or some group to go a thousand feet up and, and see how a lot of these interact. Because I, I find that we're being asked to do diametrically opposite things uh, on our farm. <coughs> To, to serve very laudable purposes, but they just can't all be met at once without uh, something given. Okay. Any panelists want to tackle that one? Uh, knowledge brokers, all wise. Uh, um, tran uh, knowledge transfer agents. It's a great series of points, right? Because there's all these silo things going on, and, and that. So there's a couple of things running through my head. One is one. The first is that's that's the importance of this kind of conversation we're having over the course of today and wherever else it's going to happen. 
that really these things do interface. There's no way to really separate them. Secondly, I think this is the challenge that, that the practitioners have kind of along the line from from the breeding industry right through the finished product. And how does that all come into this mix? And what's the recipe to, to uh, come out the other end intact, giving consumers what they want uh, in a profitable way and all of that kind of thing? That, that's the challenge in front of any kind of farm organization or processing sector organization. And it, it highlights, I think, for our growers the importance, the importance of what they do and how they do it is certainly not diminishing over time. And that's the challenge of today's food production. And uh, I think it's great for us to be aware of it because all of those pieces move. They move independently of each other and they collide. I don't know that a thousand foot look is really going to resolve the issue in terms of the people that are that are paying the way in terms of the consumer approach. So I think uh, uh, it's about helping consumers understand the food production system and then working back through and helping our, helping our farmers, uh, I won't speak for the others, uh, knowing what that consumer is looking for and how they best respond to it in practical terms. I think it's a great point. I don't, I don't know if there's a simple answer, but I think it's one that you've highlighted and that we all need to bear in mind in, uh, in neon lights as we move forward on these things. Thanks. Any other comments, Steve? Yeah, I think I'd agree with the, the overall approach. I mean, we have to take into account uh, all the direct and indirect impacts of some of the decisions that, that are being made. and. Uh, I guess I'd go to, um, who would I go to? The, uh, <laughs> not the promotion uh, department, but the, uh, sorry, the promotion departments of a retail and restaurant, right? Who's driving this change? Consumers. Who is it really? It's retail restaurant from, you know, from animal welfare, from a lot of different aspects. Because it, it's marketing, and that's the word I was looking for. The marketing departments, thank you. But, uh, <laughs> It's the marketing departments, and uh, it, it's one of the reasons that, uh, that last year Chicken Farmers Canada put together our sustainability strategy to talk about all the different elements. And this wasn't necessarily something you know brand new, a whole bunch of new initiatives. It's actually what we've been doing in terms of food safety, animal welfare, and microbial use. But it was putting it under one cover so that when we go talk to you know the national retailers, we say you know here's the whole package, and we need to consider this. Uh, it's the same thing on a number of different fronts that we're facing right now. Um, so I would just say that we need to keep, hit, you know, taking that message and, and bring it home, and, and hopefully, it's, uh, hopefully there is uh, an understanding. But uh, that, that's where the pressures are coming from. Okay. Any other, any other uh, questions, comments, ideas from the floor? Things that arose at tables that. Okay. Jim's going to offer free culture and sensitivity testing. <laughs> My boss is here, so I better not do that. The, uh, th this has nothing to do with, with laboratory stuff. One of the, we, we've, I've, on my list here, the, we've talked about um, the coordination of research and, and then alternative science versus regulation. We've got a lot of data and we're constantly writing it down and we've, we've talked about benchmarking. One of the things, and I noticed there's some, looking at Jane Carpenter here, one of the, some research going on on this big data thing and how, how to put it all together, but, but I, I think that's one of our major places to, to look. We've, we've already got it written down. And we need to make information out of it and, and go from there. Okay, make, make use of the data that we're already collecting. Everybody can agree with that. All right, we're, uh, I think we're running out of steam. Uh, the ideas have, have come forth. Uh, questions have been answered. I think we maybe have one more. If you have another one afterwards, uh, we can entertain that too. So at our table, there's a recurrent theme of uh, integrated research and uh, you know whether it's a balanced goal, whether it's making use of what we know, but so that everybody works on the same goal. Uh, so that was uh, pointing towards regulatory academia and industry working towards the same goal. So it uh, seems like uh, it, it came up at several tables. Uh, at our table, we have uh, people that are involved in uh, developing alternatives, so something that was, uh, that was mentioned, uh, effective alternatives. Uh, and also a very simple concept that uh, you know, more than more research is simply uh, to be a crying need for implementation of what we already know. 
So uh, there is no need for more research in some way to implement simple, uh, simple improvements at the farm, would it be biosecurity or management practices for uh, disease prevention. Yeah, excellent point. Any uh, panelists want to respond? Yeah. I just want to come back, um, those are really good points, and I want to come back to something uh, both the, with regard to Scott's comments about benchmarking and to Greg's comments about, you know, why do we see products be successful perhaps on one site, farm site versus another, and this whole, when we look at that very sim simple um, genetics equation where we have genotype plus times environment equals phenotype, so I think one of the things just for researchers to think about is um, really it does come back a lot to that environmental aspect, whether we're looking at benchmarking or product evaluation, and how it may what may be happening with the biological stress response of animals on farm. Um, when we look about the biological stress response um, has a lot of impact on metabolism, but particularly um, immunology of that animal or, or immune complex of that animal. So one of the things that I think a lot about, about why something being successful on one side versus another side is I really then am trying to focus on what other factors may be there that are being immunosuppressive. And uh, one of the things I look at a lot is what may be contributing to a stress response additionally to that, in addition to that health challenge, what other stress factors may be there um, on site at a particular Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Any other questions uh, from the floor? We've asked uh, asked for the coffee. I think uh, we have some there. We're maybe going to refresh the. Uh, More coffee's coming. More coffee's coming. We have another question to comment here. Just to follow up on that theme, uh, we did a lot of talking at this table about uh, um, uh, focusing on the, the good side as opposed to the individual pathogenic organism and reacting to the individual pathogenic organism. So it's looking at, at the overall view of how to enhance the, the good biome, the, the good management and so on. And one big thing could be uh, what is the actual economic impact of good management? Uh, it's money that drives the industry and if you can show an excellent payback for it, that would be a very good research project. Okay. Any, any response to that? Any? Okay, anything else, folks? All right, I think we've, uh, we're ready to uh, turn the page. Uh, do you have any final comments? Or? I do actually have a few final yeah. comments. <laughs> <laughs> Well, first of all, uh, let me thank you, Scott, for doing such a wonderful job. So when I asked Dr. McEwen if uh, he would uh, possibly consider being the moderator, he said, oh yeah, of course, by all means. And then he discovered that it was much more than what he bargained for. So, But I, I have to tell you, Scott, you've done a marvelous job of uh, really flocking, you know, everyone and, and ensuring that, you know, uh, the discussions are focused and, you know, we are going to be able to use some of the materials that we are going to be gathering here for informing uh, the next step. Uh, the next step in this process is going to be the creation of a center of excellence around innovation in antimicrobial stewardship, and you're going to hear about it um, in the next short while. And in addition to that, I have to sincerely thank uh, our esteemed colleagues uh, from various different walks of life in poultry industry, from academia, from industry, and also from government. And I, in particular, I have to thank my colleague, Dr. John Prescott, who's actually no longer with the University of Guelph as a paid faculty member, but I always see him, probably he's in his office more often than I am in my office, <laughs> even though he's been retired. I never see you. <laughs> so I'm actually summarizing this guy, but John Prescott is always in his office doing things you know that he's been doing for the last. I'm not going to say how many years, uh, John. At least I know what women's washroom is. So. <laughs> <laughs> so it it's been a wonderful panel, and I'm uh, very much thankful to the panel for their wonderful uh, comments and discussion. So please join me to thank the panel. Just a few comments. 
some of the things that I heard over the last uh, hour, 45 minutes or so, I would say is really music to my ear because as um, uh, Malcolm Campbell also alluded to, Jan Sargent and I, my colleague Jan Sargent from Population Medicine and I are in the process of launching a major initiative around antimicrobial uh, use and antimicrobial resistance and essentially innovation in antimicrobial stewardship. I cannot claim myself as, as a person who's an expert in this area, but I do actually have wonderful colleagues, you know, right in the back and also among the audience uh, from whom I'll be um, uh, getting a lot of advice as we go along. Uh, some of the things that uh, the panel mentioned or members of audience mentioned, including what Mike Petrick was talking about, you know, having a more holistic view of what goes on in the farm and in the industry is in fact on the top of our agenda. Some of the things that um, John Prescott mentioned about uh, uh, the new pan-Canadian framework and the research and innovation pillar of the pan-Canadian framework, we are in fact very much aware of that and that has informed the creation of this antimicrobial stewardship uh, center of excellence. So there are six themes within the center of excellence, the proposed center of excellence. Uh, we are going to be looking at some of the management practices and Steve, I believe it was you or someone else talked about some of the management practices that have been uh, in existence, but maybe you know, we need to take a better look at them scientifically and ensure that those management practices are in fact valid and they can lead to a reduction in antimicrobial use. Uh, the other aspects of the center of excellence that we are proposing is to look at alternatives and, uh, to antimicrobials and develop novel antimicrobial alternatives uh, with the help of our colleagues such as John Barta, such as Billy Hargis, and there are a few other colleagues across Canada that we are trying to garner their support. And overall, we've been able to garner the support of approximately 55 to 60 researchers from across Canada. And we've also engaged, I would say, all various layers of, of government, from provincial government to uh, federal government. Uh, we've also engaged our industry partners, including CAHI and uh, commodity groups. Uh, as part of our center of excellence, we are also going to be looking at um, something that Patrick mentioned, which was related to rapid diagnostics. And unfortunately, we didn't really have a whole lot of time today to talk about rapid diagnostics and what we can do in order to integrate all these bits and pieces of data that we can gather, either through better management schemes, better diagnostic systems, and so forth, in order to make better decisions. And essentially what we are going to be talking about in the future is how to uh, manage flocks in a more smart fashion. And just to give you a bit of a heads up, Bruce Roberts uh, sitting in the back, Executive Director for, uh, for Canadian Poultry Research Council and I are talking about um, uh, creating a workshop around smart poultry production. And I think what we have talked about today is essential for creation of like I said, some sort of a smart management system for poultry production in Canada. I've, I've heard quite a bit about benchmarking, and in fact, as part of our proposed um, center of excellence, we are going to be do, doing a lot of benchmarking. And I should also emphasize that what we are proposing is not just for the poultry sector, it's supposed to be something cross-sectoral, so we are going to be putting some emphasis on pork and beef, and perhaps to some extent on uh, dairy. So it's going to be a cross-sectoral initiative. We are also going to be looking at some of the economic cost-benefit aspects of uh, these interventions, better management systems, or perhaps you know the smart uh, production systems. Because you know it, it, we can't really fool ourselves by thinking that you know if we do really interesting research and cutting-edge research, it's going to be adopted by end users. So what we are going to have to do is to ensure that what we do actually makes some economic sense, and uh, we are in the process of ensuring that we have enough stakeholders and enough contributors to that aspect of what we do. And there are a few other components to the center of excellence. It's supposed to be a five-year endeavor. Um, hopefully, it's going to be accepted uh, by, by the federal government. And I think uh, that the presence of our MP, Mr. Longfield, here was, um, I would say, a good testament to the fact that the federal government seems to be um, in tune and, and they seem to be interested in this particular subject matter. Uh, if you're successful, we are looking at approximately 25 to 30 million dollars of funding from federal government and um, usually centers of excellence run from anywhere bet excuse me, between 5 to 20 years. So there have been some instances in which 
centers of excellence have run up to 20 years. So you're basically looking at the next generation of scientists and producers and government people who are going to be contributing to this proposed center of excellence if it's successful. But I do actually need your help as we go along in order to make sure that we are going to be able to create a good platform for this proposed center of excellence around antimicrobial stewardship. And I'll be knocking on your door. So don't worry. If you haven't been able to say anything today, there is going to be time. You have my email address. If you don't have my email address, I'm sure that you have Ravi's email address. So start sending emails either to me or to Ravi about your ideas, your opinions about you know, what we can do in order to serve you better. So having said that, I think Ravi, we've got... Ask people to hand in the Yes. Yes, absolutely. So please just leave your uh, sheets on the table and we are going to be collecting those sheets and uh, we are going to be using them in order to inform the next step in, in terms of creation of our center of excellence. So having said that, I believe uh, we have coffee. Do we have coffee yet? So we have coffee, refreshed coffee, and also we have some cakes, I believe. Yes. We do. Fantastic. <laughs> so thank you very much, everyone, for attending our, our research day. Uh, safe trips home. I know that some of you have come from long distances. Uh, safe trips, absolutely. And Ravi was just telling me sponsors. So uh, let me just one more time acknowledge the sponsorship of GIFO, uh, sponsorship of uh, Yorkshire, Yorkshire Valley Farms, Omafra, uh, and the Catalyst Center, and Egg Farmers of Ontario. Thank you very much, everyone, and safe trips.